Welcome to TUPF. Thank you very much for coming. As you may know, today we are running a number of open science seminars during the day in the context of the working group in open science of the Alliance of Severo Ochoa, Maria Maestro units and centers. Now we have a talk by Malcolm Bain, who is a lawyer who collaborates very frequently with, with us, supports UPF in, in many of these aspects. On the topic of research data and the adaptation to uh, GDPR, no? I imagine you as users have uh, experienced no? the, the changes done by GDPR in many of the services, and also research data are affected by them. So basically, uh, Malcolm will provide an overview of the work we have been doing uh, in order to generate a protocol that is useful for the Department for Research Data in general and the adaptation for, for these protocols to the GDPR in, in particular. So he will be running the presentation. There will be open questions later. Thank you very much, Malcolm, for coming. Yeah, what do you expect? Uh, I have a tendency to walk around. Um, I don't know if the camera's gonna follow me like like Michael J uh, no, I don't think it's, okay. So good, 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 good afternoon, I think it is. I think I know lots of people here. Some usual suspects. Um, okay, so welcome. Um, this is probably the, the, the session when you start to cut your risk, commit harakiri, and says, I don't want to be a researcher anymore, um, especially not working with personal data. Um, so, you yeah, know, the, the objective, is, as Aurelio said, is to try and make handling data as easy as possible and to make sure that the, um, the heads of department of do not go to jail. Um, this is the new... Uh, element in the GDPR is that the heads of research departments, if you are processing data illegally, they will go straight to jail without going past go. And they certainly do not collect 200 euros on the way. Um, anyway, so <laughs> jokes apart, the, the, um, this is a headache. GDPR is a headache for everybody, um, not just me, mainly for you. A any GDPR victims here? All put your hands up. Well, who's had, had to do click, 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 click? Yeah, and all these pop-up banners and all these accepts and extra accept and triple accept. Um, so the, 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 it's a good thing and a bad thing. I, it's, it's, it's a bad thing in that it's, it's more red tape. It's more bureaucracy. It's more uh, work. But it's a good thing because it's really trying to uh, ensure quality in terms of data management uh, or personal data management in any institution, company, organization, public uh, administration and research groups. Um, so what we've been working on is trying to actually make this as painless as possible. I think Alistair here would disagree with that totally. Um, so um, just a quick run through um, and some fast questions actually. Who, who, who processes personal data? All of you, come on, we all, we all have email. We all, we all have you know, 250 contacts or 2,000 in our email, uh, in Outlook, or if you're using Outlook or whatever you're using, Thunderbird. We all have personal data. Um, who actually, who processes any sensitive personal data? So kind of like political, uh, religious, uh, children's data, what, things like this? Okay, so you're aware of that. Um, do you know if the, your organization has a data protection officer? Is there a data protection officer in the room? No, not the, yes, yes, yes she's there, I, one of them at this area. Hi. Um, what we found actually working, not just with UPF, but with other or institutions, organizations, is that they usually have no idea what data they have. They no, have no idea where the data is. They have no idea who processes that data or what for. Um, and they know how dear who, to whom they are pr uh, passing or transferring the data. And all of those are actions which the, the, the law actually says that we have to be very aware and we actually have to document what we do with it. So to prove to, to everybody that we actually do know um, what we're doing with it. I mean, just as in a research group, you'd normally know what scientific data you've got and the quality of that scientific data, and you should know where it's stored, and you should know who accessing that scientific data. Well, personal data should be treated in, in very much the same way, with the, with the rigor and the quality of any scientific process. And so we're in the right place for that, because we're at the UPF. Um, we all know that the, the law came into force last year, but in fact, it's been around for two more years, and we all started getting into compliance in May, as opposed to uh, getting ready to finish our Um And it's, it's been more strict, it's more detailed, it's, it's creating a single market in, or single environment for data processing across Europe, 
which should help um, cross institutional uh, collaborations between you know Germans, French, not the English, they're out, we get rid of the English. Um, the, at least they think they're out, they're not quite sure. Um, and uh, which should make transferring or sharing data between research entities much easier because if the data is legal and legitimate, et cetera, in uh, the UPF in, or in, in a Spanish organization, then it can be properly processed by other institutions around, um, around Europe, at least. So, um, and then what it did, it established some key principles. Basically, what the law said is, these are the key principles. If you comply with this, you're good. And then the rest of the law, which is about 86 or 100 and something articles, is implementations of these um, eight key um, principles. And the last one is the new one, which is called accountability, which basically means document, and document, and document again. Okay, so it means the, the controller, who is the data, the UPF in this case, um, is responsible for data, but also needs to prove it, needs to show, have evidence that they are doing things properly. Um, it's not just a kind of like a policy that you put in the drawer and you forget. Okay, so, so like not day to day, but at least month to month, management of data, so you know that and you've you evidenced it. Okay, so the, the what what the protocol we've been looking at has tried to do is to. Um, ensure that the research projects at a, at a project level, although obviously it should be done at an institutional level, but at least for research projects, runs through these different principles and say, yes, we comply. Okay, And, and I'll go into a few more details uh, with some of them. But it th also means that when you get to the end and you can say, yes, I can prove I'm complying, you have the protocol, you have the documents, you have the people who are trained, uh, you have the information systems, you have the security measures, implemented so that um, actually you you know if you um, the inspector comes um, then the, the the heads of department don't go to jail basically so um, there's a whole bunch of obligations the first one obviously having a legal basis for processing so being legal <laughs> uh, we need a data protection officer that's no problem we've got one uh, we as a public in administration universities uh, or at least public universities need to do a privacy impact assessment which is a formal document analyzing the data that, that is processed and the risks associated to that data, and therefore what measures need to implement to minimize those risks. And you can imagine that if it's a small you know, SMB with you know, uh, a, a mobile app or something, this is not too difficult. But in an institution like the universities, any university, that has multiple research groups, has multiple track you know, of, of teaching, post-grad, undergrad, everything, it's a huge task. Um, actually doing this this for each of the streams. So what we've tried to do is to make, at least at a, at a project level, taking the project as the, as the, as the unit, um, so that, you know, imagine that if you have 50 research projects, if they all do follow the same protocol and they produce the same documents, then when they send this to the data protection officer of the, the DPO, is really, really happy. She says, yes, all my work has been done. Um, or at least some of the work. The other obligation, security measures. This is, you know, the big thing. You know, what security measures do we apply? Oh, we need, we have passwords to access Google Drive. Yeah, well, that's it. You know, I mean, what about, you know, do you do regular backups? Do you check that the backups have, uh, are working? Um, do you have access control? Who do you give passwords to? Are they inside the institution? Are they outside the institution? Do you have a single password for everybody to access the same database? Often the case. Um, admin with a password, admin. It still happens. Um, <coughs> so, and then as I said, documentation. Documentation, some of it's proactive. It it's makes you think. Like for example, the record of processing activities, which I'll show you later, is, is basically a document which shows that you know what data you've got, you know which IT systems it's in, and you know what you do with it, and you know how long you keep the data. And until you've done that reflection, you're not legal, because you have to do that reflection. Um, Information. There's a whole lot of. It's, we're lawyers. We produce documents. I'm sorry, um, but the uh, all all of these different documents, which I can show you models of. We've got models for this. Um, actually, it helps working through this. What I call this objective of having quality um, in 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 the management process. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of them. So you're okay. You won't go to lunch with indigestion. Um, the most in difficult one, I think, is is. On what basis are you processing data? Okay, it's obviously I'm doing it for research. Okay, but the law actually says there are six legal basis or basis informed consent, which everybody knows because we go click 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 click. 
Um, performance of a contract, not your case. Although actually, uh, any employees in the room? Staff, employees, personal contracts? Okay, well obviously the UPF the, or, or your institution is processing your personal data as, an, as a staff on the basis of the labor contract, the employment contract. Okay, just to give an example. Um, but that doesn't mean to say if you're kind of like running a very large online database with sounds and music, um, that you have a contract with the people who are uploading sounds. You do actually have a contract, but um, it's not that type of contract. Compliance with a legal obligation, uh, that's usually the kind of like the tax man. Protect the vital interests of the data subjects, so that's the doctors and the, the, uh, the hospitals, so they can process, you know, they can pick someone up in the, from an accident in the road and start getting their name and address and what blood type they are without having the informed consent. Um, they're not quite in the state to give the informed consent, usually the, that type of patient. Most interesting, actually, necessary for the task of a public interest. The really good thing is, is that research is declared to be in the public interest. I'm not sure if all the research carried out here is in the public interest or is at least publicly interesting, but at least it's in the public interest. Um, and finally, the, the catch-all, i.e. a basis for processing, is the legitimate interest of the, of the data controller, which is the university or the research organization. Okay? And obviously, that organization has a legitimate interest to carry out research and to, to ac access and have data to perform that research. Okay, so if you look if you look at the last two, public interest or legitimate interest, you don't need consent. There's this big myth that we have to have informed consent for collecting data. So I, I have this kind of like motion online. Online, it's called noinformedconsent.com. Uh, there's lots and lots of work that can be carried out by university and by research where you don't actually need the informed consent of the user. It's good to have it, and your ethical committees may say. You can only carry out this research if you have the informed consent of the person. But that's a, a different issue from the purely legal issue of on what basis can I process data? Okay. So if your research is in the public interest, because you're doing a research in you know, biomedicals or something that useful for society, no comment on that one, um, then actually getting data to perform that research does not need the consent of the user, surprisingly. Okay. Um, but anyway, it's always good to have it for ethical purposes. Also, anybody processing special, yes, you had a few hands up for special categories of data. Yes, special categories are, are as I said, political, religious, trade union, um, sexual uh, behavior, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The law gives them extra protection. So not only do you have to have one of the six grounds, but on top of that, there are specific, there are only 12 grounds, um, additional grounds. Okay. Um, the first one is consent, express consent. But actually, the last one, um, Jay, I think it's 12, um, necessary for archiving and scientific research. Okay, so if you can show that your data is necessary for scientific research, then um, you're, it's okay to process um, you know, psychological data, biometric data, um, data about people's beliefs or, or um, sexual habits or whatever they do. Okay, so that's the first thing, the, the first step. And in fact, any project proposal, anybody writing a project proposal for 20, 2019, 2019? Have you kind of gone through this pr thought process? Do, am I legitimately collecting this data? You don't have to answer, yeah, but, but um, okay. But it's, 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 I know you, you write up this report for the ethical committee, yeah, which is good. Uh, and I know actually they've included lots of personal data stuff. So this is the reflection you have to go through before you even start collecting data. Is it, why am I, you know, am I legally entitled to do this? Okay. As I said, the, the legit legitimate interest is an easy one in a way that it's a catch-all. Uh, but all you need to show is we have an interest to collect the data, um, which is more important than the interest of the, of the person. So again, there's a question, you know, how much data do I need? Do I need all the data I'm, I'm collecting or only that data which is necessary actually for my purpose? Okay? Um, and the law admits that scientific research can be legitimate, um, <laughs> which is nice for scientists to, to, to think that the lawyers are um, supporting their cause. Anyway, um, so it, a part of the protocol, um, we have this like, um, decision tree. So are we, are we collecting special data? If we are, then we've got a special thing, and then we, we run through this like decision tree. Uh, it should be vertical maybe, but 
on wide screens. It's, it's gone wide screen. But this is kind of like uh, 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 boxes to help people work through uh, what they're doing. And there's a document to support that. Okay, so that's the, like the background of why we need these protocols and what we've been doing. And in the law, actually, there's there's actually quite a lot of references to to to, to research, uh, recognizing that that you know there's there's it's legitimate uh, for for processing personal data. So that, uh, oh, I shouldn't have touched this again. Anyway, there are three types of data: scientific, at least the ones that are mentioned, scientific data, historical research, and statistical research. And you, anybody do any of this? No, you don't do any of this. You do other types of research. Oh, yeah? Come on. You all do. <laughs> you must some just do some statistics, no? You don't run statistics on your projects? Ah, yes, I get some nods. Okay. And some science? Yeah? You're actually doing some science. Okay. Well, I'm glad about that. Um, at least your employers are glad about that. <laughs> okay. So the, 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 the basically, the, most of the work that one does in the university or research center is covered by um, the concept of research, which is good. Um, uh, because they have some exceptions from some of the legal requirements, not many. Okay. Another issue we had to look at. So the, 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 this question of legitimation, is it legitimate? So mainly we look at the three. So consent, obviously. Uh, task, a research task or, or legitimate purpose. Okay. Um, one of the big problems we've had is, problems, challenges, is that um, data is not just used for your research project. It's kept and then reused for other projects. Anybody reusing data? Or anybody making available data for someone else's reuse, you see? This is difficult because that person, who, anybody transferring data to another institution so they can use that data, yeah? The original purpose may not be the same. You may have collected some crazy data about sounds and people, how interested people in sounds, and then suddenly this data is used for political, uh, you know, guessing what they're going to vote in May. I'm just guessing because I don't think there's a, there's a correlation there. But you never know, huh? you never know. Um, so if you do collect data for a specific purpose and then you share it with third parties, parties it normally for entities other than research institutions, this would be illegal, okay? Because it has to be limited to that specific purpose. One of the advantages we have is that um, scientific research is considered a compatible secondary purpose so that you can actually expand the use of the data so long as that um, processing is compatible. I can, I'll talk about it a bit later, which is very important. Um, to take advantage of the research exceptions, um, Article 89 specifically sets out some criteria that the research organizations have to implement. So we need appropriate safeguards. Does anybody implement appropriate safeguards? I hope no one puts their hand up. Because the answer is, it depends. Because they'd have to say, what is an appropriate safeguard? Yes, I know you're all um, people. So technical and organizational measures to minimize the data and minimize the risk. So has anybody done a risk analysis on their data? No, you see, we're pretty quiet here. This is not good for the, um, for the heads of the research department. Anyway, so um, oh, oh, what they're saying is, it's fine. You can take advantage of the ex exceptions of consent and et cetera, et cetera, but only if actually you do really do look after the data with appropriate measures to ensure the confidentiality, to ensure the integrity, and to ensure um, that this, it's not used for different purposes, okay? Um, and that you don't collect too much data, which is the principle of data minimization, okay? Um, also, in fact, the uh, concept is to try and anonymize the data as early as possible in your, in your processing. Okay, to, to analyze, do I really need personal data? Can I anonymize this here and then carry out the rest of my research on at least anonymized, if not pseudonymized um, databases? Because that will minimize the risks um, if, if any data gets, uh, escapes. Okay? So um, th this, this is some of the requirements, is that we must implement these, these measures. And um, one of the ideas, one of the, the objectives of the protocols is to establish some form of minimum agreed understanding of what is an appropriate safeguard for the type of data that you're using. And that's something that actually is on a case-by-case -case basis. Because the safeguards for uh, you know, user registration data is very, very different from the safeguards for children in academic uh, you know, learning environments or whatever. Okay? Sensitive data, I've already mentioned, so, so uh, uh, I won't go more into data. But we do need to have additional safeguards for sensitive data because the risks are higher if you have a problem. Okay? 
Um, and then further processing again. If you if you do know that you're going to data, you're going to be processing data or keeping it for other objectives, then there's an analysis again. A thought: um, what, Is there a specific link between what I did originally and what we want to do now, or what someone else wants to do now? Um, is it reasonable to think that if someone gave me their data originally, it's not too far if I actually want to use this for another purpose? You know, they can still think, yeah, that's okay, they'll do that. So there's a, there's a reflection to say uh, uh, to be made about um, that. And finally, uh, what might be considered appropriate measures? Uh, so the law itself says specifically, try and pseudonymize, try and anonymize, try and get rid of the personal component so that you're actually working with uh, um, anonymous data. Because that actually, the really good thing is then you don't have to comply with the law anymore. <laughs> you no longer have personal data. But the other thing is, especially that if there is a breach, data breach, or if there's some unauthorized access or whatever, then the risk is much, much less because no one is actually, actually accessing data that is, is, is um, understandable. Okay? And the rest of it is basically technical measures to ensure the, the confidentiality. Okay? But that's just specific to, to research data. On top of that, you still have to comply with the rest of the law. You still have to get information to the data subjects. So, the, you know, the typical form of, no one reads, but they should read, of information. You still have to do a PIA, in a privacy impact assessment. You still have to document everything you do with the data, because you have to have a record of processing activities. And you still have to have protocols for dealing with various events that can happen in, in the life of, of the data. Security breaches, people asking to access and delete the data, if you transfer the data abroad, uh, at the end of the project. And then anything that can happen during the life of the project, like new staff, changing the staff, changing IT systems, um, changing the purpose, you know, re reusing the data for another purpose. So basically, we do, we, all that, these, these items have to be thought about, which is the most important thing, and then actually documented, the decision made. And this is what the protocol is for helping. Okay, well, I'm not going to go into the details of this. this is information, this is for sharing afterwards. This is the typical information thing. This is typical about uh, how to get consent. We can talk about, uh, have questions about that afterwards. Um, complying with data subject rights. This is in Spain, is the famous ARCO, Derechos ARCO, um, to access or change the data, remove it, um, and limit processing. What the law has done actually for research institutions, it has reduced those rights. But if you have the data from a data subject, oops, I've done it again, don't touch. Um, you can actually, um, the, the, you may have a right to say, no, I'm not going to er erase your data. I'm going to keep it because I'm keeping it for scientific purposes. I don't need your consent for, for scientific purposes. And therefore, um, I will keep this data because it's still useful for uh, you know, epidemics, you know, for, for, for understanding medical uh, things. It has to be special, okay? Um, so, so there are exemptions um, to, to prevent you losing all your quality data, because basically all your data subjects could suddenly you send you an email saying, please remove my data. And suddenly your database of you know, 30,000 samples is reduced to 10. And that statistically is no, is no good anymore. You can't earn it. Okay? So they're trying to protect that. Um, one of the new things, the really new things, is, is what happens if you have a breach, a data breach? And, and obviously, the, the, the one you imagine the data breach is someone accessing the Google Drive where you've stored all those hundreds of thousands of data in, in an Excel table or something, or someone accessing the password into your, hacking into your IT system and accessing the log for, of the registration. But there's, there's, there's much more simple things, like you know, sending the wrong email to the wrong person, um, or sending an email, but not putting people in blind copy, but in, in thin copy, you know, you know 50,000 emails. Emails are personal data, even professional emails, unfortunately. Okay, so there's, there's obligations in, the, in the, the new obligations for this is that you, if there has been a breach, you have to have a protocol for dealing with it. You have to record what you did with it. And if it has significant impact on the personal or the person, you have to notify the agency, so it'll be the Agencia Catalana de Protección de for the UPF, um, and you have to notify the data subject so you have to tell them, hey, I'm sorry, but all that you know, really confidential medical data about yourself, you know, your psychological profile, is now you know, floating around Twitter or wherever they, they float around. Not what you really want and not good for the, um, the reputation. Anyway, so basically, wh what does the law say? And now we'll look at the interesting bit. The law says, okay, you can process data. It's not as strict as you think. Okay? You can um, 
avoid certain requirements. You can process data without consent, but you do have to implement specific safeguards to make sure that you're processing this data properly. Okay, and that's the difficult bit. Okay, it's actually is, is in measures. And so the whole objective of, the, of this protocol is to make it really much easier so that you don't have to kind of invent all this, but you can follow a checklists and you can follow the documents and just fill in the gaps. Um, and we did it with FreeSand pretty painlessly, yeah, more or less. It's great because Alistair's done all the hard work for you. Um, uh, Alistair is the lead investigator, and this is for the streaming. He's on, on the FreeSound project um, and, and has been the guinea pig for, for uh, the first uh, implementation of the protocol. No, second implementation, because we did that actually work with Davinia's project before, but not the full protocol. Um, okay, so what have we got? In practice, uh, the first thing to do, and this is what you people don't forget to do, is to identify the data you have. Okay, and there's much more data than you think because there's all those logs, all those web server logs. They've all got this personal data in those web server logs because there's the IP address of all those people that are accessing the platform. Um, so, and um, where is it? What's been done with it? Okay, and then I I've set this out actually in, in a, a, at an institutional level of governance. You know, what does the organization do? But I think this needs to be taken down to the level of at least the department, and if not the department, right down to the level of the project. So is there someone who's been, is in charge of thinking about personal data at a project level, discussing it with the head of the department, and the head of the department maybe also discussing it with the data protection officer if there are significant issues, okay? And then, you know, have you set up processes and protocols for dealing with all these horrible things like consent, security breaches, et cetera, et cetera? And what the, the, the idea has been is that at least across the departments where uh, we've been working, so the Mayan Mesa project, um, um, which is, to have a single framework so it's fairly similar for all the projects and makes it much, much easier for my management as a whole. Okay, so what is the result of this? So the result of this um, is to implement some of the key principles of, of that the law lo looks at. Okay, so we look at risk, we take a risk-based approach, so we try and understand the risks associated to the data um, and actually decide then what to do, what, what do we need to implement to protect it, okay? We've done a mini impact assessment, because that's what the risk analysis is, but the idea is to contribute to the institutional PIA, because the institution as a whole needs to do a PIA, okay? Um, implement privacy by design. So coming out of this whole reflection is the idea, what can I do to minimize the quantity of data I have, to maximize the privacy of the data subjects? Okay, so do I need to reprogram some interfaces? Do I need to change the architecture of how the, the data is processed? Do I need to implement um, security measures to reinforce like encrypting the databases so that th the information systems are designed to, to be more compliant or to help you be more compliant, okay? I including technologies, okay? And then obviously the gatekeeping. So how does it come in, in, in practice? In practice what happens is that the win we looked at, this is the protocol, we looked at how the life of a project, from the project start to the project close, uh, and, and we, we identified different steps, act tasks, to be carried out at each stage, um, with the deliverable or whatever comes out of that task. Um, so that, that then is stored uh, in the drive or wherever it is that you want to store your, your, your personal, um, your, your documents, okay? So project stuff is mainly anal ana ana anal analysis, filling in a questionnaire, analyzing the data you have, carrying out the risk analysis or assessment, getting authorization, because this goes through the ethics committee, um, uh, and or the DPO, and or the DPO, depending on the, however uh, the organization is going to set up their, their governance, okay? And then the core of it is the management, is in section four, is during the life of the project, which could be two years, it could be eight years, it could be forever, um, then you know how to ensure that we are complying with all these requirements through the life of the project. And finally, at the end of the closing, what do we do with the data? So do we just delete it all? Which is what the law says. The law says if you no longer need personal data, you need to delete it. The scientists will say, hey, don't delete my data. <laughs> okay, you can anonymize it, get rid of the personal element, keep the anonymous, because then you can do statistics, you can do historical analysis, okay? Or not, depending on what you want to do. But at least you have to think of what to do on, on closing. Okay, so here I've got a, uh, just some details, uh, mapping, describing the project's information flows. Um, there's a questionnaire for that. Identifying risks, identifying uh, 
uh, transfer the different different elements which which can um, have an impact on the data subject and on you. Okay, getting authorization. So this means internally um, authorization from the institution, but authorization according to law. So do you need to notify the data protection agencies or um, any other uh, formalities? And then during the life, ensure that internally and externally you've got all the right information, documents, everything to be able to, to comply, okay? Um, which l gives rise to a whole lot of documentation, okay? And the closing, then the closing tasks of, of do we delete all the data, do we, can we keep it, and what do we keep, okay? So um, the result of that is that we have a, um, for each project, what we're suggesting is a standard template of a policy, an internal project policy, uh, not the policy you read on the web, a policy, internal governance policy, um, which is fairly simple. We've actually got a short version and a long version <laughs> um, because we were asked to have a short version because it was too long. Um, uh, and then has a whole lot of annexes, which is this like kind of record, registrations, rec records of what we do um, and, and for dealing with the different uh, processes. Um, the advantage of that is if you actually move from one project to another within the institution, and actually if this becomes like a standard, it won't become standard, but if it could, then obviously the privacy practices in the next project or in the other department or in the other institution or in the other you know, collaborative H2020 research project should all be the same or very, very similar. So there's no new, you know, there's not this uphill struggle every time you have to do a data management. Okay, so let's have a quick look at the documents. Do you want to look at the documents? You want to get you really bored just before lunch? Um, I'll see if I can make this work without the machine turning off. Hold on. Um, let's have a look. Here we are, free sound. This is the free, there's no personal data in this. Is it okay to reveal most of this? Um, okay, so this is, it's, a, it's eight pages. It's not that long, okay? Um, but I just want to show you the, I just want to show, I'll jump out of all the things. I just want to show you the index, because we don't want to go into the horrible details. Um, they're not being shown. How do I get rid of this? If I do that. No, it doesn't, sorry, it doesn't want to do it. I have to get rid of this one. I can't get rid of this one. There we go. Right. Okay. Um, basically, it's got an introduction, as usual, the purpose, scope of the document, how the governance, so section two would organize, how is privacy organized? In a small project with five people, it's very easy. One person does everything, unfortunately. But so sometimes you've got these cross collaborations, cross institutional collaborations, um, where you need to decide which of the, the um, how is data organized across the organizations, okay? Then um, set of actually the, the thought, the reflection of, you know, what is the lawful basis of processing? Um, how we minimize data, how long we hold data, how we guarantee the quality of the data and what we do with the breaches, that those kind of like processes. How we respond to people's rights and, and what implement measures. So that's basically what the document sets out. And there's a framework and it's filling in the gaps. And we've made it easy actually, we've made it highlighted in yellow so you know what you have to fill in. Um, anyway, so I won't show you all the details because, um, but the, some of the example here, we've, we've made it easy because we've got some, some definitions which help you, and then, then you take the decision here. Another decision, and you said in here, we've got no sensitive data. We do this to minimize the data. This is the decision on, 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 on retention. This is the decision on data quality. Okay, so that's, that's basically what, the, what the, um, the, the policy looks like. Um, uh, within, within, the, uh, the, within this, one of the things we first have to look at is what is the basis for processing? Is it consent? Is it legitimate interest? So we did a legitimate interest analysis, um, which is a document that the, that's required, you know. Uh, what are we trying to achieve? Is it legitimate? Um, have we complied with all the steps? That's, that's another document in there. Um, what else have we got? Uh, this is the protocol, which I'll show at the end. Okay. We've made a, uh, one of the big topics that the agency has said they will look at is dealing with uh, people who contact the entity and say, please delete my data or please remove my data or whatever. So how do you actually respond to that type of request? Um, and it'll, often it'll come in through an email. Uh, it could be even an automatic system now. There are, I think there are companies that are trying to make money out of this. Um, they send automatic requests. So the, the, the I, can, I can log on. I say, my name is Malcolm Bain. Please 
send an email to the world to remove my data from their systems. And they have automatic systems that, that just send out these horrible emails saying, please delete, please delete. And you don't know if it's legitimate or not. So there's a, there's a protocol saying, you know, what do we do if we receive a request? What do we verify? And what do we have to do? Um, and then how do we respond to that? So there's kind of like different, different forms for responding. Okay. Uh, what else do we do? This is uh, this is the annex to the to the to the um, the, the privacy the govern privacy policy. So we've got the we've got the risk analysis for the specific project. We've got the legitimate interest analysis. We drafted the notices, you know, like the web notice um, for for accessing or for lo loading web on the web. We set out security measures, and and then there's a set of protocols in the department for dealing with it. Okay. Um, I won't go into the details. More and more, a little more practical. This is the record of processing activities. Okay, so it uh, it it, it uh, analyzes what type of data and uh, they have and where they're kept and how long we keep it. Okay, um, so this is the first step of analyzing what data we've got, how long do we keep it, what do we do with it, where's it stored? And I think online we have some. Do we have some list of inventory? Yeah, don't we? Of, of it. Okay. Um, so how does how does that what does that end up as? That end up as the protocol, which is here, um, which is this document here, which is obligatory reading for everybody before lunch today. And there's an exam as you walk into the um, uh, canteen. Um, what, what does section three point two say about um, you know authentication? Now this is a kind of like an, um, a, a, the long form of the, of the protocol. So with all the detailed steps of what you need to do. Set up a system inventory, set up a record of processing activities, analyze the legal basis for your processing, and then document it all. Because imagine, worst case scenario, you know, um, you win the lottery on Friday and you go to the Bahamas, which is the normal thing to do. Um, you're just leaving behind the baby. I mean, and, and, the, and the head of the department has to pick up this baby and deal with it. And if you haven't documented what you've done, well, he's going to have to start again. So the whole idea is to have uh, this evidence and this, this, this pr uh, process so that if you do win the lottery and go to the Bahamas or wherever you want to go, Thailand, then the, the project is sustainable and it can continue. Anyway, so there's, this is the brother. And then here's the risk analysis. Uh, here's the authorization step, implementation step. So it's a, basically, it's a long and boring protocol of all the steps you can do. And the idea is to go tick, 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 tick. I've done that. Okay. Um, so that then you can sign off and go to the Bahamas. Um, okay, that, that's that's basically where we are. So that that's um, what we the work we did. <laughs> what we did. So as I said, we've got a protocol for the for for that that you run through to go tick tick. Okay, you set up your privacy policies so that there's a there's a governance document for privacy in the project, and then you have a whole lot of annexes. There's the mess missing there. Annexes. Um, which actually report the decisions you've taken, okay? And I'll give you an example of what we do in FreeSound. And that's it. Thank you very much. Don't, don't bore you more um, on, on that subject. Okay, I hope it's been useful. <laughs> um, as usual, we'll, we'll, I'll sh we'll share. Yeah, we're sharing the presentation. So you don't have to take photographs. They're copyrighted anyway, so I'll see you at the door. Um, but I've got a whole load of link r references afterwards if you want to look at some stuff. And then there's some actually, the actual articles from the law, if you really want to read them, articles from the law. So, thank you very much. Um, do you have any questions? This is when I usually get the absolute silence. If I do talk, to talk about copyright, I've got 15 questions. And to talk about GDPR, and everybody says, no way. So I don't know the details about how do you need to validate documents that you write. So you have your methodology. You showed us example to make those legal. Um, ideally, uh, what you would happen, I have no idea how this is going to be organized in, in your institution. The document should filter up to the data protection department. OK? Not looking at anybody here. Um, but, but technically speaking, they should be able to have to validate this, so th because they're the ones who are going to be, uh, if there's any inspection by the agency or there's any, any mess, they're the first people who are going to have to respond. So ideally, this 
document should channel up to the data protection department. Uh, however, that's organized. It depends on the institution. Uh, so that they can say, yes, this is fine, okay. All right. I, I don't think all of this is not going to go to the ethics committee before approving a project. I think when you, when you first are outlining the project, you do obviously a first little bit, analysis and probably a risk analysis, and then put that in your ethics report so it goes up there, saying, yeah, we are aware of personal data, we are managing it this way, and this is the consequences. That'll be enough for the ethics committee. Okay? But I think actually when you do implement this, the ideal would be for a copy to go to the um, some form of you know, formal process within the institution to the data protection person, because they're the ones who's going to have to respond, saying, yes, this is good, no, that's not enough. Thank help? you. Wow, it's, it's crystal clear. Question. You have a question? Oh. The microphone. Yeah. So <clears throat> you said about reusing others, others' data, no? and that if you fulfill no, GDPR in Spain, you can reuse if you understood properly in France. No? D depending on the purpose, yes. OK, exactly. But, but how? But this is based on trust, I guess. No? So if we are reusing data from colleagues in other places and they claim they are following all the steps, but actually it's just based on trust. There is no registry. I don't know. No? It's, it's trust and verify. Um, so it's, it's both steps. I mean, it, t technically speaking, yes. And, and the same when you are sharing data with colleagues, they're going to trust you that you have properly documented and you have the right consent or you have the right basis and you have the legal basis for transferring the data to them or giving access to them. There is an element of trust. The, what the, um, the law has introduced is the second element, which is verify, which means don't trust. <laughs> verify means if you're going to give me this data set, you give me some form of certificate or give me something that proves that what the, my access is legitimate. It's within the scope of processing, it's within the process, or I have the consent for this. So technically, if you are receiving data from abroad, um, you, do, you want the, that confirmation of, of this, you know, you shouldn't say, just give me that data set and I can do what I want. What you'd say is, give me the data set and give me, tell me what was the purpose limitation so that I, can, I know that my processing is within the, the, the scope of, of what was authorized originally. Okay, so it, it adds a level of a layer of, of, of red tape, a layer of, of protocol to transferring and sharing data. But it means that you then are more comfortable that you can actually do the processing you want to do. Yeah, otherwise you, it, the, the worst answer is I don't know. If you imagine the worst case scenario, apart from the Bahamas, with, um, the agency ins inspects, you have, an, you have or someone reports you to the agency and, uh, and says, and they come and investigate. And they says, and the agency says, where do you get this data from? Uh, we got it from the university in Munich. Uh, and, and, and what is the legitimate basis of your processing? Oh, I don't know. That's the worst, you get a fine. You, just for saying I don't know, it's, it's 3,000 euro fine. Well, actually it's the public administration, so you don't pay fines, but I mean, um, you didn't pay fines. But if you're a private company, just for saying I don't know, you have a fine, because you're supposed to know. Okay, this is the whole the principle of accountability. Okay, so when you do receive data sets or when you do send data sets, I, I send, you, know, you give access, you should actually put a, a piece of paper saying, hey, the, 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 the limits of your processing is this. You don't seem happy about that. <laughs> and according to what you said, if you make data available it is the responsibility for the, the the one using the data. I mean, not from the collector. Correct, correct. I mean, if, if you have legitimately made it available, and what you usually have is a data sharing agreement, okay? And and I have seen these many in collaborative projects like H2020 projects, where in, within inside the data management, you have an annex on data sharing, and 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 there's a process for how the data is shared technically you know, FTP, secure FTP or whatever. Um, but also there's a, uh, like, statements between the parties saying, I have collected this data for this purpose, you will use this data for this purpose. So there's some form of contractual uh, agreement there between the institutions. 
Okay. It, it is one of the most difficult topics because once the data has gone and someone else has it, you no longer have control over what people are doing with it. And you're still responsible as primary data controller. This is too complicated, uh, but uh, is, I mean, I just want to check that what we do is the normal thing is, is correct. We, we normally try to find a Creative Commons license that works, and so we, we share the data with a given license, and then we put it in, a, in Zenodo or some place. That, that's, describe... that's assuming it has no personal data inside the data set. Okay, so this is fine without personal data. If yes. there is personal data... You cannot use a Creative Commons license. You cannot use... Okay. Okay. So uh, it, it has... It, uh, if it's only, anonymized... The exception it's fine. I can think of is that maybe you got consent from the data subject, the person, mm -hmm. and they said, I'm okay for you for sharing this data under a Creative Commons license. Very difficult. One, they don't understand what a Creative Commons license is. So a correctly informed consent Maybe you might. Uh, I still think that, that would be a breach of data protection law. Okay. You, you cannot share personal data under a Creative Commons license, okay. with some exceptions. Okay. okay. So this is why the, the law is very uh, kind of like pushing anonymization, so that you can share openly. Yeah. I mean, in, the, in the context of open data yeah. and open science, um, this policy should help you understand what, which elements of your data sets you can publish under an open science because it has no personal data in it. Question back. Ah, hi, yeah. I have a question. So you were saying that uh, if, you, if the research is a part of public interest or something, you don't necessarily need consent, right? Yes. Is that correct? So who does decide it's it's matter of public interest? You. Okay, so so that makes it convenient, I guess. Well, no, I mean, you're the person who knows the scope of processing, the purposes. You're the person who knows what you're going to do with this data. Yeah. So do you have a legitimate interest to have this data for this purpose? So for that, I don't need consent if I was able to prove it's about Correct. The best for the public. Or uh, absolutely. Okay. Okay, uh, I mean, everybody asks for consent because it, it makes it clearer and it's easier. And as I was saying before, I think for ethical reasons, there may be reasons, you know, do you want to participate, you know, for data sub, do you want to participate in this focus group? Do you want, because it's, it's ethically correct to ask them if they want to consent. Is that? But once they're in the group and they say yes, the, the, obviously, you know, it's, you can't just, it's not free for all. You can't just do any type of processing. The processing has to be necessary for, the, for that purpose. And that purpose has to be a legitimate interest. Okay? So then sharing the data on Facebook is, is not quite necessary. So you can't do that. Okay, thanks. Hi. So, yeah, this, this, uh, I agree that this sounds complicated. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, we we're trying to simplify. No, no, no. It, but it's a work in progress. Huh? No, no, but I mean, I mean, unimportant at the same time. So here's my question. It seems to me that, I mean, being so complicated, so the key point here is the data pro protection officer, so this person that I mean, holds the accountability and then knows about what, uh, whether an IP is a personal data or not, what do you need to do, what, what processes do you need to have registered and so on. And I got the feeling that there is, there is less of these data pro protection officers represented here than the institutes. So my question is, is this an issue? I mean, how strongly should we go back to our management saying, hey, where, where's my data protection officer? Uh, is she, it? She's in the room. <laughs> I don't know what your institute is, but certainly one from the UPF is here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, um, I, I belong to a different institute, of, a different uh, uh, Severo Choa Institute. Yeah. I don't know, so here's my question. I mean, uh, among the different Severo Choa Institutes, yes. I mean, uh, is, how, how, how big of an issue is that, uh, I mean, have a well-identified and easy access the data protection officer? And this might be a naive question. I don't know, I'm a researcher. It's an open, it's an open question because it really depends on your institute. I mean, there are, there are, uh, there are entities which have, been, have put a very big emphasis on protocols, legitimacy, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and therefore there are, uh, I mean, this is just still a work in progress. So it has not been implemented fully here yet, let's just say. But um, I know other public administrations where th there's, a, there's a strict procedure. There's a well-known person who is the data protection officer and, and, and all the requests are channeled through to the, his, it's a, it's a man, his office. Um, okay, so, so it depends. I mean, uh, maybe you're in another institute where they have forgotten about the GDPR. And so there's nothing implemented yet, okay? Um, it, it, that is really institution by institution. But the law requires all public administrations and most research uh, organizations of public administrations, they must have a DPO. And that DPO has, has specific obligations under the law. So it'd be very rare for them not to have someone and some protocols and some things established. Okay, and that's Europe-wide. In fact, and it's even more of a risk because if that institution is then collaborating in H2020 research collaborations or whatever, there is a shared uh, obligations among the, the, the institutions with respect to data processing. So it's, very, it's a high risk for the entity not to have proper data management. More questions? So uh, my question is, what are the legal consequences of uh, not having this uh, data protection officer in a, so I can imagine that uh, there are many institutions that uh, they don't have it yet. I'd imagine no, I imagine most institutions do have it. <laughs> I mean, I, I would imagine that most institutions do have a DPO. You may not know who the person is. <laughs> But it'd be very rare for an institution not to have a data protection officer today. A year ago, I'd say no one. But today, after so much noise about GDPR, so much emphasis from the agencies, from the European Commission, uh, in the European funded projects, there's lots of data management plans. It'd be very rare for an institution not to have a DPO. Okay? Um, the law is changing with that respect because previously public administrations did not have to pay any fine if they did not comply with the law. Okay, that's changing too. I'm not quite exactly clear what the administrative process now, but there's certainly a risk of, risk of administrative um, consequences. Maybe you can answer that one. <laughs> um, okay, but it'd be, I'd be very, very surprised that a research organization does not have a DPO. No, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I mean, that, that's me putting, you know, hope, optimistically be surprised. <laughs> No further questions. Lunch is calling, I know. Okay, well, thank you for your patience. And we're trying to simplify the protocol. We're still working on it, okay? And just to make it much more easy to adopt. It's, it's complicated because the law is complicated. I'm sorry for that. Thank you very much.